Good day, everyone. I'm delighted to uh, welcome all of you to this discussion um, on how we can uh, establish a common democratic agenda uh, among the democracies of Europe, uh, North America, and Asia to deal to defend democratic norms internationally and deal uh, with uh, both the human rights and security issues in Asia. Uh, we're going to have a discussion that will involve two people from uh, Europe, uh, Zygis Pavlionis, who is the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Lithuanian Parliament, uh, and Alina Polyakova, who's the president and CEO of the Center for European Policy Analysis. And then we're going to go to uh, Maiko Ichihara, who is an associate professor at Hito Tsubashi University in Japan. And finally, B. Kim, Sh B. Kim Shah, who is the Rep the representative uh, in Washington of the Taipei Economic and Cultural uh, Office here. Um, and we're looking forward to that. But before we uh, hear from them and have this discussion, uh, it's my great honor uh, to introduce the president of, this, of the Senate of the uh, Czech Republic, uh, uh, Miloš Vistrichil. And a little over a year ago, the summer of 2020, he led a, a large delegation from the Czech Republic to Taiwan, um, and he spoke before the legislative yuan. And in that speech, a very important speech, uh, he recalled John F. Kennedy when he went to Berlin in 1962 and said, "Ich bin ein Berliner. I am a Berliner." And it was a sense of it was a declaration of solidarity. Uh, that the United States was going to stand behind Berlin, which at the time was um, really uh, the centerpiece of the of the Cold War when uh, it was being threatened by the Soviet Union. Um, and he declared before the uh, legislative yuan in Taipei, he said, I am a Taiwanese, Wo Shi Taiwan Ren. Uh, and he said it, you know, in Mandarin, which was quite remarkable. And uh, he is uh, a Czech leader who stands in the tradition of Václav Havel, the tradition of human rights and democratic solidarity. And we're very, very honored uh, to have a message from him uh, to open this panel discussion. Thank you. Vážení pane Geršmane, vážení diskutující, vážení posluchači, pěkně vás zdravím z České republiky. A jsem velmi rád, že mohu přispět k vaší diskuzi o ochraně demokratických principů, o boji proti autoritářství. Když z pozice českého občana přemýšlím o boji proti autoritářství, o ochraně demokratických principů, tak první, co považuji za důležité, je znát historii a vědět, jak fungují nedemokratické režimy, jakým způsobem likvidují své protivníky, jakým způsobem likvidují své odpůrce. Nedemokratické režimy mají na svědomí miliony lidí, které, kteří umřeli v lágrech, kteří nemohli studovat, kteří museli odejít ze své země. Druhou podmínkou, která je důležitá pro to, abychom v boji za demokratické principy byli úspěšní, je, že si uvědomíme, že v rámci ekonomických aktivit demokratických zemí musíme vždy dobře vážit, jakým způsobem budeme spolupracovat s totalitními režimy. Je důležité nepodléhat závislosti a je důležité si uvědomit, že podpora dalších demokracií by pro nás měla být vyšší hodnotou než okamžitý hospodářský nebo ekonomický prospěch. Protože my z Evropy, ze střední Evropy víme, že pokud hospodářský prospěch upřednostníme před obhajobou hodnot, tak potom na to jednou velmi doplatíme, protože totality si mnohem více následně vezmou, než nám dali. A ta třetí podmínka je, že bychom si měli uvědomit, že nefunguje mocenský vývoz demokracie, že je potřeba získat občany, dané země proto, aby byli aktivní, aby aktivně bojovali za demokratické principy, aby se vzdělávali a aby měli vzory v okolí, které je podporují. Proto si velmi vážím i aktivity pana Geršmana a jeho nadace, která právě tomuto napomáhá. 
jsem velmi rád, že jsem alespoň takto krátce mohl něco říci k tomu, co si já myslím o tom, jakým způsobem obhajovat demokratické principy a jakým způsobem bojovat proti autoritářství. Pokud vám můj příspěvek bude inspirací, budu rád. Přeji vám pěkné jednání a hlavně nám všem přeji, abychom byli v boji za demokratické principy úspěšní. Um, and it was a great way to start uh, the discussion this morning, um, especially the second point made by President Vistrichel, uh, which was really critical of uh, what you might call a mercantilist approach to dealing with foreign authoritarian powers. In other words, putting economic interests above human values and human rights. Uh, and this is something that Václav Havel spoke about a lot. And I want to begin uh, our discussion this morning with uh, Zygis Pavlionis, the uh, chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Lithuanian Parliament, because uh, earlier uh, this month, uh, Zygis, uh, the former Secretary General of NATO and, and Prime Minister of Denmark, uh, Anders Fogh Rasmussen, uh, wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal in which he criticized uh, France and Germany and other European countries for taking what he called the mercantilist approach to dealing with China and putting these economic relations first and really wanting to be neutral um, in, the, uh, in the problems that the United States is having with China today. And he warned that this could affect, if, if they uh, try to adopt the neutralist approach, uh, it could affect uh, the US position on uh, NATO and the defense of Europe against uh, Russia. And then he singled out Lithuania in this uh, article saying that Uh, it had uh, dropped out of the 17 plus one initiative uh, that China had to deepen its economic relations with Central European countries um, and as even uh, is beginning to develop uh, formal relations with Taiwan. And he said, if a country of fewer than three million people can take such a stand, why can't the rest of Europe? Um, it's, a, it's a very, very important question. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about Uh, what's happening in terms of Lithuania's initiative with Taiwan, it's real, the, the pressures that it's been under uh, from China, and what uh, lessons this might have for Europe as a whole. Sigis. Well, thank you, Karl. Thank you, friends. Uh, it's, uh, well, a lot of thoughts when I, I look to you, Karl, and uh, I remember what you did uh, for my country. And maybe I will try to, you know, remind uh, the people about your history and actually the history of uh, Rasmussen himself. Uh, you know, Karl Gershman was fighting for Baltic freedom when we've been still occupied. It was 84 or you tell better, you know, in United Nations, you, stand, you stood against the Soviet delegation and it was Karl Gershman who supported first steps of our fight. Uh, you know, even our national movement uh, received first fax machines uh, from Karl Gershwell, Catholic Chronicle uh, was spread. So you are at the beginning of our fight. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was very difficult to feel that solidarity when, you know, we've been faced uh, with aggression here. I saw Soviet tanks who killed my friends, my, my friends from my own school that was the closest to TV tower, but you've been with us. And then Let's remember Rasmussen. You know, Denmark was the only country from NATO that from the very beginning uh, uh, were pushing Lithuanian NATO membership. They were so much alone. Then Karl Bildt appeared in 94, wrote an article, Baltics, this is a litmus test for your humanity and, and more or less uh, democracy. Fight for the Baltics because if you do not fight, uh, you know, you lose as democracies. And Karl Bildt, our Nordic friends, convinced Europeans when acceding to European Union to establish the similar relations with the Baltics. And finally, we've got EU and NATO membership. But in the beginning, it was few personalities, few countries, or Iceland, who recognized us the first. Uh, and they were already then attacked by Soviets. You know, they experienced all economic sanctions and so on. What I wanted to tell Look, um, Lithuanian story is a story of success. You know, we are 30 years independent and so on. But for last 15 years, friends, we are failing because uh, we do not unite uh, for democracies who are um, under attack. Well, I was present at Bucharest NATO summit where 
Ukrainian and Georgian dreams to enter NATO uh, were sacrificed. And what happened? Countries were occupied. Uh, uh, we see uh, uh, annihilation of Belarusian freedom every day here in Vilnius, uh, yeah, where you know Putin is so much supporting this dictatorship, uh, killing and imprisoning people just you know 30 kilometers from my office window as uh, I speak. And now turning to Taiwan. Look, also, please remember that Taiwan was among countries who supported us even during occupation. Our embassy in Washington, D.C. was open because of our American friends who never recognized the occupation. But countries like Taiwan and others, they were supporting our own embassy, our own survival during those 50 years of diplomatic resistance. And when we saw the statements coming from uh, communist China that after Afghanistan, next is Taiwan, you know, for for us in Lithuania, uh, it uh, you know it reminds us a lot of historic uh, mistakes uh, uh, that uh, actually resulted into annihilation of countries like us. Uh, so the fate of Taiwan, it's the fate of the Baltics. Uh, when G Russia invaded Georgia, we came into the streets of Vilnius and we said. Um, the same what Czech Senate, leader of Senate said to Taiwan. We are Georgians today and we are all Taiwanese today because we don't want something to happen with Taiwan that already happened with us, not actually once. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, we are asking now our friends uh, in democratic world to unite on Taiwan. First of all, leaving uh, uh, divisive format, so-called 16 plus 1, before it was 17 plus 1, we have already left. We really think that our brothers and sisters from Central Europe who suffered so much from communist oppression would leave this format that divides Europe, and not only Europe, but Europe from United States. And together, in inside the EU tw in 27, we will uh, uh, create a format where we speak with China in united voice, but not only together with American friends, with our, uh, f uh, you know, British friends, all democracies that would unite in democracy summit, we would find a way how to speak in one voice with autocratic regimes, including China. And we would also invent some uh, anti-coercion mechanisms that uh, EU is inventing on its own if China is attacking today with economic sanctions Lithuania. So EU is retaliating with the same amount of damage to China for them to think next time when they attack, you know, Czech Republic or any other country. I think this kind of anti-coercion mechanism could also be uh, approved in United States of America uh, because, you know, it would be good that the strongest uh, democracy in the world defends countries like us who try just to express the solidarity uh, to the people of Taiwan, for example. And last thing, Yes, uh, uh, I hope very soon, uh, in the beginning of November, uh, uh, Ta Taiwan will open a, a Taiwanese representative office in Vilnius, and we will open uh, our office uh, in Taiwan. And I hope that other countries uh, will simply name Taiwan with its proper name, uh, because naming it differently, it's kind of invitation for the one big country to occupy another. And this is not the way we have to uh, behave. We have to deter those countries uh, who sometimes uh, read this world in its own way, like Russia read uh, uh, the world after Bucharest NATO summit, like invitation to occupy Ukraine and Georgia. And we shouldn't do that. I think we it's time to learn from the history and time to name Taiwan, Taiwan, and actually defend its freedom uh, with all the means we have. Thank you, Zygis, for those very strong remarks, uh, and actually, in a way, very provocative remarks, and uh, it sort of sets the stage for uh, what we want to hear from Alina. Alina, are the European countries ready for the challenge that uh, uh, Zygis has just outlined? Well, thank, thank you, Carl, and, and thank you for being part of this conversation with SIPA. Um, you know, I wanted to pick up on a very important point that uh, the president of the Czech Senate, uh, President Vistuchel, made, and that was about this notion that our foreign policy as a transatlantic community 
does not need to be based in values when it comes to our engagement with China. That this is really about economic instrumentalism because the leverage points on the economic side are so deep, meaning, of course, that the United States and, and China, also Europe and China, are very, very closely linked economically. Uh, many European companies that are the base of European growth and prosperity now look to China as their key export market. So we're seeing a shift happening in the global economic system where at one point China was a key market for production, uh, but now high-end products, cars, computers, all kinds of Western products are now also being bought in China as that country grows economically. And I think this dynamic is creating a sort of reticence about confronting China. And I was really taken with some comments we've been hearing recently, both from uh, the French uh, president, the French foreign minister, as well as the outgoing chancellor of Germany, uh, Chancellor Merkel, uh, who all seem to be speaking with a very similar, and I think we're very worrisome voice to say that we, um, as the foreign minister of France said, you know, we want to engage China whereas the United States wants to confront China. And I think this policy engagement implies that the democratic community of the transatlantic states is not united by any means. And in fact, we're quite divergent in our views of China and our broader views of authoritarianism and what that means. And I think we really underestimate that we have a huge amount of leverage. We tend to talk about Beijing and China holding all the cards. Um, on the economic side. And as a result, we aim to pursue an interest-based, meaning economic interest-based transactionalist foreign policy. But I think the point I would want to make, picking up on uh, what Zygis rightfully said, um, is that if we start to slip on values, then we put those on the back burner, or we put those as a tier two um, objective when it comes to how we engage with authoritarian states then this is exactly how we let authoritarianism creep into our own societies. You know, it's not just about foreign policy. It's not just about economics. This is really about the struggle for democracy that is happening within our own countries. Uh, certainly, this is happening in France. It's happening in Germany. It's happening in Lithuania and the Czech Republic, and it's happening in the United States. And we just have been too slow to recognize that relationship between our foreign policy approach as well as what's happening in our own societies. And unfortunately, based on what we've been hearing from some of the most you know, democratically consolidated countries in Europe, large countries um, in Europe, France, Germany, of course, being the top, but others as well, um, is that they're not ready, that they are putting economic interests first. And I really would uh, push the leaders of Germany, of France, Italy, other large European states, to look at what Lithuania has been able to do. As you've rightfully said, Carl, it's a small country, but this small country is making a huge difference. And if we had the same approach um, in Germany and in France, recognizing that there, there's a cost, there will absolutely be a cost to standing up for our values and for really thinking about what it means to lead with our values. There will be an economic cost there, but I think it's a cost that we have to take in the short term to ensure that we have long-term democratic cohesion and long-term democratic resilience. And I really believe that the Biden administration in the United States is committed to this. And I hope that the upcoming summit uh, for democracy, the administration is aiming to organize in December, will just be a starting point for building and mobilizing momentum to start our democratic fight. Because right now we're not all in it together and I think we have to we have to be on the same page or we will lose. We will lose this fight going forward. And I think countries like Lithuania are just such a bright light um, in what we can do together if we understand the leverage that we have and if we understand how critical it is to let values drive our engagement with China, Russia and other authoritarian leading states. Thanks very much for that, uh, Alina. And, uh... You know, let me underline that there is no uh, either or when it comes to engagement versus confrontation. Um, there's no way in this world today, uh, given the size of China's economy, that countries are not going to engage economically with China. But that doesn't mean that values should be ignored. 
um, if China wants to uh, break off economic relations because the country takes a particular position on Taiwan or Tibet, uh, that's their, you know, that's it's its choice. But as far as you know, democratic countries are concerned, you can have trade relations with a country, but that doesn't mean that you need to sacrifice values. I now want to, you know, turn to uh, the Asia region. Um, you know, sometimes this conflict is seen as a conflict between China and the West. And in no way is it that because uh, there are many countries in Asia that are deeply concerned about China's policy and its uh, desire to establish uh, a hegemony, not only in the region, but beyond. Um, and I want to turn to uh, Maiko Ichihara uh, to hear from a perspective from a, what is actually a frontline country today, Japan, um, and to hear uh, what the thinking is in Japan on how to deal with this problem uh, and what the prospects are for uh, uh, establishing closer ties with European countries in this common uh, in this common effort. So, Maiko, let's let's hear from you on Japan's view of these issues today. Hey, yeah, thank you very much, Carl, um, for the introduction and um, the wonderful um, question. Um, I would um, argue not only for Japan, but also um, for the Asia in general. Um, and um, let me make, um, in general, three points. One is that, um, well, including Japan, well, Japan has been leading this discourse um, of the um, free and open Indo-Pacific vision. And um, there has been um, shared um, understanding that um, we have to work harder um, to strengthen the narrative of the liberal uh, the, about the importance of the liberal democratic um, values and norms. And so um, this um, has been going on um, for the past um, nearly ten years um, already in Japan. But um, what I uh, what I feel um, being in Japan um, is the necessity of doing more um, on this front, especially um, in Asia, the um, principle of non-interference is, is so strong so that um, well, um, many actors in the region um, tend to hesitate about taking um, stronger um, commitment um, in democracy, liberal democracy. But um, we are now um, in the time that um, we have to de-mainstream uh, de -mainstream, um, the non-interference um, policy and um, emphasize the liberal international uh, liberal democracy and democracy and especially um, well emphasis should be um, placed um, on the importance of liberalism, given that um, democracy has been used um, as an excuse uh, excuse by um, many politicians in the region. Um, um, for um, to legitimize uh, the control by the majority of the minorities. And secondly, um, and relatedly, um, we should um, think about um, uh, well, how to strengthen, um, I mean, well, we should um, well, review um, the principle of um, sovereignty um, system in the international order. Um, well, now we are in this, um, you know, very um, transformed international society where um, the discourse, which has not been screened by um, professional media, um, have been disseminated through SNS, which has um, transformed um, the um, and um, attacked, um, transformed the um, narratives and um, has been attacking um, the discourse, liberal discourse um, in the international scene. And um, so um, we on the pro-democracy side also um, has to um, sort of counter, um, you know, these narratives. And um, it's not only the countries that can do, uh, do this job. Um, apparently, we individuals, um, NGOs, activists, um, non-governmental um, powers, um, including political parties, should be uh, mo mobilized. Um, and so we should um, place um, or um, importance on discovering those um, human resources, network them, and um, and um, sort of inclusively, um, in, well, um, ne uh, well um, you know, organize those pro democracy actors for this sake. And thirdly, and finally, um, however, um, one thing um, which is difficult um, in Asia, as well as um, many um, major um, European powers, is that. Um, um, we are in this region where the um, China's influence is so strong, um, not only economically, but um, in terms of um, you know um, every um, aspect, including 
for um, environment, um, COVID and, and everything. And so um, there, well, I would say that there's no strong basis um, amongst the populace um, which supports um, confrontational sort of, um, you know, approach against China. And so we have to um, be careful in some, well, some, for example, terminologies, um, well, maybe using the term um, well, democratic alliance might not uh, might be counterproductive um, for uh, in mobilizing those um, Asian populace. So we we should think about some you know alternative um, soft sounding terminologies while um, maintaining uh, maintaining our commitment into the uh, liberal international norms. And um, that's going to be um, well important for two reasons. I would say one is that um, we can avoid um, increasing the um, well you know security tension between China and um, the, the democratic powers while um, or supporting the norms of the liberal democracy. And secondly, um, we need um, international cooperation with those authoritarian powers um, for um, non-security, um, non non-political um, spheres um, such as um, you know, COVID and um, well, environment. And so we should, um, you know, make sure that um, there is a room for international cooperation in those spheres, while we make sure that um, we um, keep our commitment into the norms of democracy. Thank you. Thanks very much, Maiko. And before we break, I hope you're going to give us a good alternative term to uh, democratic alliance, perhaps something based on common common norms, uh, common values, uh, human values, which is what it is, um, as opposed to. Uh, uh, authoritarian uh, imposed norms. Um, B. Kim, uh, it's just such a great pleasure to have you with us this morning. And, you know, Zygis mentioned Carl Bildt, the former prime minister of Sweden. And I was at a meeting in Ukraine in 2014, um, right after the, the Euromaidan revolution, where Bildt came and, uh, and he said, and this is in May of 2014, he said that Ukraine was the epicenter of the global struggle for democracy. Um, and I think one can actually say today that, you know, for a lot of reasons, Taiwan is the epicenter because so much pressure is being put on Taiwan. And your president, uh, President Tsai Ing-wen, uh, wrote a very, very important article in Foreign Affairs, uh, in the current issue, really, in which he said that if, uh, if Taiwan falls, it's not just going to affect the Asia region, it's going to affect a lot democratic alliances and alliances all over the world. And perhaps you could you take this opportunity to give us the, you know, Taiwan's understanding of the situation today. It's really talk about being on the front lines of a global, of a global problem, a global struggle. That's where Taiwan is and how Taiwan, um, you know, sees its relationships with other countries uh, and uh, how it uh, understands uh, the implications of its own security for stability and peace in the world. So, B. Ken, it's great to have you. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Carl, uh, especially uh, for your leadership and continuing commitment uh, for decades um, on global democracy and your familiarity with uh, the issues that matter, uh, so that are so important for us beyond just um, academic discussions, but for so many of us, these are existential um, policy questions. Um, the enormity of the pressure of that Taiwan faces that you correctly highlighted um, is very complex. Um, it is multi-domain and multi-level. Uh, multi-domain, I'm referencing um, security pressure, economic pressure, as well as a uh, political pressure. In terms of the different levels, uh, we're talking about um, global uh, competition in the systemic international organizations, um, narratives that challenge um, our understanding of the rules-based international order uh, with an alternative narrative um, that the Chinese are trying to uh, promote, especially in the recent 50-year uh, anniversary of uh, China's, um, um, the PRC's uh, participation in the United Nations Security Council. Um, you know, on the sub sub international system, you know, on the state level, you know, we're talking about you know cyber security attacks. We're talking about military coercion. Um, we're talking about state sponsored influence, um, political interference, which goes to the next level, and that is um, the need to build up our civil society resilience uh, against 
um, political interference uh, that comes in many forms, including disinformation, including uh, the use of market leverage uh, to dominate mainstream media and information campaigning, uh, et cetera. Um, and it also involves economic leverage uh, that also uh, exerts pressures on different sectors of our society that then translates black back into uh, political pressures. Um, so, you know, this is a very complex um, uh, picture that we are facing. And I think that the Summit uh, for Democracy that's coming up is a good opportunity to examine what those challenges are and to try to find us a common agenda uh, in, in dealing with these. Um, in the context of the transatlantic dialogue that's been discussed uh, earlier this morning, um, you know, we, we've heard a lot of discussion on so-called strategic autonomy uh, in recent years. And that's usually brought up in the context of transatlantic uh, policy, but we don't hear the same term strategic autonomy when it comes to China policy. Um, and, and instead, um, it seems that a Chinese a use of economic leverage uh, to coerce or pressure or influence a European policy is a challenge that is not, um, you know, I wouldn't say it's not taken seriously because there is some debate, uh, but it's not spoken on in the context of the need for greater European unity and greater autonomy from Chinese coercion. And, and I think um, in discussions like this on a global level, uh, it's important that we really highlight the, 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 the complexity of the challenges that we face and also because of the nature of the hybrid threats that our democracy are facing, also look at the solutions uh, in a hybrid way. And by hybrid, I mean, you know, public private sector partnerships, um, international systemic, but also, you know, intergovernmental um, NGOs, um, you know, civil society, different level approaches um, to this very complex issue. Um, on the security side, uh, we have seen, at least uh, in, in the past year, some more action, and we appreciate um, President Biden's leadership in um, whether, whether it's through uh, senior level summits um, or other levels of engagement, uh, bringing the security issue um, to the agenda. So unprecedentedly, we've seen uh, G7 statements, we've seen uh, NATO discussions, uh, we've seen China, Japan uh, summit uh, statements and you know, Australia and others uh, are uh, more involved in underscoring the importance of peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. And I wanna say that this is not just a matter of principle. It has um, disruptive global consequences uh, if there is a breach of security in the Taiwan Strait. Um, you know, I think in recent months we witnessed um, the disruptive impact of a single freight cargo stuck in the Suez Canal. But I want to say that um, global commerce that goes around the area of the vicinity of the Taiwan Strait, um, the technology supply chain disruption, the disruption to global commerce, um, and also, of course, upsetting the geopolitical strategic balance of the Indo-Pacific region um, are severe consequences that the world will have to face uh, in the case of a disruption or breach of the security uh, of the Taiwan Strait. On the economic side, uh, we have seen some progress also, but I think more has to be made. Um, in Europe, there is some preparation of for, for working out some instruments to counter coercion. Um, it's not clear specifically what those will be, but I think it's important that there are these discussions and preparations taking place. In the U.S. Congress, there is a recent initiative, a uh, bipartisan initiative, um, also on presenting an act uh, to counter uh, China's economic coercion. Um, so I, I think these are, are indications of, of the beginning of some more thorough discussions, and, and, and we certainly hope that uh, given the existential nature of the challenge that many of our democracies face, um, that further progress can be made uh, by the time of the, the, the upcoming summit. But of course, in the process leading up to it, as uh, many of our countries are uh, hoping to take part also in multiple levels and, gar 
Garnering greater uh, civil society NGO participation is critical to the third area, and that is political resilience. Um, strengthening our democracies while, while we are also facing uh, tremendous pressures uh, on the disinformation and political interference side. Um, in Europe, a lot of that has come from Russia, uh, but I think the Chinese and the Russians are using very similar tools um, on this, and there's a lot of um, experience that we need to share, but also tools to use to fortify our respective democracies uh, so that this systemic competition of values uh, does not further deteriorate. Thanks so much, B. Kim, and uh, thanks for, you know, raising, you know, this importance of this De Democracy Summit, which is coming up on December 9th and 10th. Um, it's a big new initiative, um, and the question is how this might, uh, you know, advance the, uh, the cause that we're talking about, which was how to push back, how to develop a common democratic agenda. Um, uh, and, you know, this strategic autonomy is offered as an alternative to that. Um, but it's, you know, it's sort of a problem because it's, it suggests the more of a division among the democracies and the, and that uh, we're in this, what we're talking about here is more solidarity. So Zygis and Alina, maybe starting with both of you, uh, let us know how you think uh, this meeting coming up of the democracy agenda might contribute to addressing the um, the problems that we're talking about of developing uh, this common agenda, uh, democratic agenda. It has to go beyond Asia, North America, and uh, Europe, but still, that's a, the critical part of this, trying to bring the democracies in these three important regions together. So, Zygis, uh give us your thoughts coming from uh, Lithuania. Well. I would continue on, 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 on this discussion. You mentioned that Taiwan is an epicenter of struggle. I would agree, you know, 30 years ago, it was us, the Baltic states, uh, then Ukraine, now Taiwan. Why I'm saying like this? Well, interestingly enough, Taiwan unites us all. You know, it is difficult to find issue that unites, first of all, Europeans and Americans and all other freedom-loving nations all around the world. I could find, you know, numbers of questions that divide us. But on Taiwan, honestly, you know, I have for sudden, you know, unexpectedly a lot of friends in, in Paris, in Berlin, in London, in Brussels, everywhere I have friends. Honestly, well... Well, I have, of course, few enemies, but this is really something that unites. And we need this unity so desperately because after 15 years of democracy decline, we need some you know, inspiration and examples of success stories. And Taiwan could be the one where we you know, help and consolidate this democracy and build on it because, well... I need some other stories in my region. We are dying here. You know, I need maybe after, you know, we do it for Taiwan. We continue doing it in Belarus where, you know, people are dying in prisons, hundreds of them. And I would even love to have those success stories that would inspire democracies to continue in each region, Taiwan, Belarus, why not Cuba? where, you know, again, Lithuania is standing alone inside EU and saying we will not ratify this EU Cuba, communist Cuba agreement because there is no reference to democracy and human rights. Why don't we include that reference? And why don't our market, European market opening, in, you know, promotes democracy and human rights in Cuba? At least something we can do. So by creating those inspirational examples, we can maybe wake up the democracies and finally make them understand that, you know, humanity matters, democracy matters. And honestly, you know, even, well, okay, from our own story, you know, John Paul II and Reagan was fighting for us. And uh, a lot of countries and nations didn't want to join that fight because, you know, this actor from Hollywood was challenging the status quo that was very economic. 
But you know, I was in Reagan Museum in LA and I wrote his statement from 66. He said, appeasement with autocratic regime sooner or later leads to your final defeat. So, you know, Reagan, John Paul II, Thatcher, Karl Gershman and others who've been fighting for us, they proved to the world that, you know, human spirit matters. It was the biggest victory against this realpolitik that was actually, you know, whose worst incarnation was Hitler and Stalin who divided and killed, you know, nations like us. And it's actually, it's not only about human spirit or democracy, it's about also economic benefits. Look to Baltic states, who are now one of the best economies who inspire the whole region. You know, our salaries are much, of course, bigger than of Russians, you know, and who can say it 30 years ago when Gorbachev was coming to Vilnius and saying, oh my God, when you will leave the Soviet Union, you will be crashed dead. You know, you know, nothing will remain from Lithuanians. We are now rich people to compare with. We are much richer than Romanians and Bulgarians, Italians, Greeks, and but, I would mention some other countries. It's it's miracle what's happening. So Zygis, it, let me let me just interrupt you there and ask yeah. a quick question. I want to get on to the others, but China has been threatening Lithuania with retaliation because of its policy on Taiwan. And as I understand it, Lithuania has $2 billion in trade with China. What kind of an impact is it having on Lithuania? Well, honestly, maybe Chinese don't know economy well in Lithuania, and for sure they don't know our psychic. Actually, I, I think they are doing exactly what we want, because it was my long-term dream to reorient us from trading with autocratic countries like Russia and China and, you know, go into full speed into expanding relations with countries like Taiwan, Japan, Australia, uh, South Korea, uh, you know, where, you know, we have or we are now opening the embassies. Uh, Dependency on autocratic countries like Reagan was okay. Rephrasing Reagan '66 leads to your final defeat for democracies of size like us. Dependency, you know, crashing your freedom of maneuvers or speech or decisions, and vice versa. Expanding relations with democratic countries empowers your freedom and freedom of choice. So by this bullying and, I don't know, hawk or wolf diplomacy, hmm, China is doing something that we as Europeans didn't do. You know, I, I'm, I'm still full of hopes that one day even the hopes of President Obama to create, you know, TTIP, deep free trade between Europeans and Americans will happen. But honestly, now I think we are, you know, we will be pushed to do it because we are harassed by China and Russia. We need to do it. And uh, those, uh, those economic sanctions against us from autocratic regimes pushes us to so create something beautiful that we didn't create ourselves. So basically thank saying you China. there's a backlash effect. And, you know, Alina, I think this is... Uh... There was a backlash with Putin in Ukraine. I mean, he threatened Ukraine and he, he created a Ukrainian nation where it wasn't really as united before on these values. Do you think, I mean, that you're, how do you push back in this context today? Because China is threatening everyone who takes a position. They're now threatening, you know, the Boston Celtics because Enos Cantor uh, called for a free Tibet. Uh, how do you push back? Well, th thanks, Carl. I, I just wanted to quickly also pick up on a very good point that uh, became made about strategic autonomy, because I think this is so important because this conversation about Europe's role in the world is picking up momentum uh, quite quickly now. And we still don't fully understand what it means, to be honest with you, uh, whether Europe wants to position itself as a so sort of third power between the United States and China. Um, what that means for a sort of decoupling across the transatlantic alliance, 
uh, what that means for the European Chinese uh, economic relationship, foreign policy, et cetera, I think it's quite concerning. And I think one of the big issues that I see the Biden administration summit for democracy hopefully addressing is exactly this question. You know, what is Europe's role in the world when it comes to defending democratic values and principles? By far, I would even argue more than the United States, given the recent history of uh, the end of the Cold War, of the successful transition of so many countries to democratic governance uh, that were once occupied by the Soviet Union, Europe has a real stake in this game. And I think the sooner all of Europe recognizes that, um, the, the better. And I think the strategic autonomy conversation can be very damaging uh, unless we get to a point where we really understand what that means about the European relationship with the United States when it comes to democratic values and principles in particular. Right now, that remains very, very ambiguous. And ambiguity in this case is not strategic. It is uh, concerning. So Carl, you're absolutely right on Ukraine that when authoritarian states overstep, uh, they often undermine their own objectives in whatever country that they're trying to bully. And Ukraine's path towards Russia is not closed. It is 100% closed. And Ukraine's only path is towards greater Euro Atlantic integration. I think we too often forget to ask what the people in these countries want. We're talking about geopolitics, but if you ask any Ukrainian, anyone in Moldova, Moldova, what a bright spot today for democratic values and principles. In Belarus, what do you want your life to look like? Forget questions about values and principles. People will often say, I want my children to have a better life. Um, I want to know that we're going to be economically prosperous. I want to have access to education, opportunity. These are universal values and principles. These are the universal values and principles of democratic societies. I think we have to get back to those basic principles. And to go further, it's time to push back. We have to work with local actors. You know, I think it's all well and good to have conversations about what governments can do. But to be clear, it's not just about governments. Across all of Central Eastern Europe, you know, we've seen a backlash against democracy embodied often in one Viktor Orban, the prime minister of Hungary, but it's not just an Orban problem, it's not just a Hungary problem. And now we're seeing local actors, civil society, local politicians, organize, build coalitions to try to push back. And I think when we're talking about how do we build this global momentum, how do we mobilize, it has to happen from the very, very bottom, meaning civil society groups, individual activists, all the way to the top of national governments. And this is what I hope the Summit for Democracy will look to, how to engage all of these stakeholders, not just to set up another multilateral coalition of governments, but to actually think about how do we work with civil society, with local actors, help them mobilize on the ground, help them get the resources they need, while at the same time working at the multilateral level and I think at the end of the day, we haven't touched on this, but we have to also engage the private sector. We haven't talked about the critical role that social media can play and has played both in negative ways and positive ways for democratic movements. And certainly the world isn't re reverting from digital communication. If anything, we're going further and further into the online space being a public sphere. And so how do we build this public-private partnership? How do we engage the local communities? I think these are these are the really big questions about how do you build a social movement? Because that's what we're really talking about, building a global social movement um, for democratic values and principles. Right, and it's what uh, Beacon before had called the hybrid approach, uh, as we have to think about that. Uh, Maiko, uh, somehow I feel that Japan can play a critical role in this, in, in the very way that you said, well, maybe we need a different term than an alliance of democracies. Uh, something that would be suitable to Japan, my feeling would be also would be attractive to the Europeans. Uh, it has to be very democratic. It has to be united. But uh, what we are looking for here is a consensual approach to dealing with this problem that has, you know, full solidarity with uh, the security and political issues of Taiwan, but at the same time doesn't frighten people off. So how do you go about doing that, Maiko? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for that question. Um, let me relate that um, to um, the sum, uh, upcoming Summit for Democracies. 
Um, when thinking about um, Japan's role um, for the defense of democracy and uh, well, and also in the summit for democracies, um, well, um, I'm um, well, you know, um, creating um, especially in Asia, we do not have um, a strong regional framework um, with which to defend democracy, well, liberal um, democracies, and so. Um, well, um, we are hoping that um, you know it's going to be a, a well, good opportunity um, for the Asian actors to um, create something um, substantial um, with which to um, you know support um, democracies. But um, at the same time, I think um, many Japanese um, well um, officials um, and also probably civil society as well. Um, or sharing this feeling that um, you know it's not only um, those um, huge authoritarian powers like China and Russia that are um, that are attacking the norms of democracy and liberalism, but also those domestic political actors like um, you know in India, in the Philippines, in, in Indonesia, in Japan, in South Korea, we all have um, those populist authoritarian um, po uh, domestic political leaders who um, repress um, journalists, uh, civil society um, actors um, and so forth. And so we, uh, at the same, well, while we are fighting with um, those authoritarian powers, we also have to fight um, against those domestic, you know, populist authoritarian figures as well. And um, for that sake, um, I think Japan could um, play a good role in a in a sense that um, Japan has this um, history of sharing its um, experience with well, with um, partners um, in other countries, especially in develop, uh, developing countries, uh, without um, sort of um, pushing Japan model or something. And, and so for that sake, um, Japan creates a um, consultation body with developing countries uh, well, in, when um, it provides, for example, the rule of law assistance, um, you know, um, economic infrastructure assistance, what, uh, whatever it is. And, um, and so that um, well, Japan values the local sort of culture and experiences um, that are there and um, tries to find, um, you know, sort of um, you know, desirable um, approach for those, um, you know, rec um, recipient side. And um, when it comes to democracy, we all, we all have, uh, have to um, do, uh, we'll take this kind of approach, I believe. Um, and um, we have to admit that um, we have um, drawbacks in our democracies. We are having challenges within our countries and we um, want to um, sort of go over these problems together with other um, countries, um, you know, more sort of uh, authoritarian or li uh, illiberal democracies, so that um, we can we we can um, prevent the term democracy slipping um, well, down to a mere ideology, but we can continue supporting the values of democracy. Thank you very much. Bikam, I'm going to give you the last uh, the last word. And uh, uh, Ziga said that uh, I think a very important statement. He said Taiwan unites us all. That's quite a remarkable statement. Um, and you have this summit uh, for democracy coming up. And because Taiwan is not formally, uh, you know, a participating government in that, but I'm sure that Taiwan has a very powerful message for uh, the summit of democracy that's coming up in a, in a few weeks. Uh, so why don't you maybe speak about that? What is Taiwan's message to the democracies of the world? Well, Taiwan has come a long way in building our own democracy and our freedom. And Carl, you've uh, witnessed uh, this process. It has not been easy, uh, but because of you know this transition and, and many of us in our own lifetime uh, have lived through different systems of government and we have a stronger appreciation uh, for uh, the democracy and freedom and open society that we have today, especially in light of the regression of basic rights in Hong Kong. I think that has also been a wake up call that it is impossible to completely separate um, the so-called one country, two systems, or you know, economic uh, prosperity from basic political rights. And, and uh, it's important that um, there is a global network uh, to support um, those democracies that are struggling and, and uh, to, to find ways to counter the multi-domain multi and multi-level um, coercive efforts uh, by revisionist powers and authoritarian regimes. And so when I brought up the, the question about um, strategic autonomy, I was uh, bringing it 
up in the context of the need to build some degree of strategic solidarity or strategic unity uh, among like-minded democracies. And um, you know, I highlighted you know different levels of the threats that we are facing, but uh, it seems that the economic uh, levels of coercion are most complex and the uh, hardest uh, to deal with. And I, I just want to say that um, you know I, I think there are at least three levels in which we have to look at this. Um, the first is you know governments uh, working together to uh, forge the infrastructure so that like-minded democracies are more supportive of each other. And this could be through trade deals or organizing more resilient supply chains, um, or also you know, the, the legislation I, I just mentioned uh, in Europe and in the United States, uh, taking a deep look into tool, a toolbox, um, you know, those instruments to counter economic coercion uh, on the governmental level. The second area would be to examine those technologies that could be used I, either way, you know, if not properly, if if used properly, you know, artificial intelligence and emerging technologies uh, does advance um, human progress and basic liberties. But if used the wrong way, as the Chinese government is using it as tools of surveillance and control, um, that becomes um, a, a grave security as well as a, a challenge to our, our, our basic uh, values, a, a grave security concern, I meant. So I think we also have to look at those technologies and also um, find tools to either protect them uh, or to defend them, um, whether it's through export controls uh, or again, consolidating like-minded democracies, for example, uh, in a joint effort, uh, uh, a joint 5G clean network initiative uh, or uh, emerging technology uh, systems, uh, uh, how to further protect that, whether, whether it's just IPR or the uh, wrongful application of these technologies uh, by authoritarian regimes, uh, you know, to address all of these very complex issues. Um, the third category would involve you know, our civil societies and consumers, uh, maybe greater transparency in the origin of products. You know, we saw a lot of European uh, consumer debate over um, you know, Xinjiang uh, cotton and forced labor. Uh, we are, um, you know, in, in the context of Taiwan and, and our farmers facing uh, economic coercion, our pineapple farmers, the Japanese consumers uh, stepped in uh, to be helpful uh, to support uh, these different sectors that are facing a uh, severe coercion. And I think, you know, it's even before Lithuania, Australia, the, the Czechs, um, even Norway and, and Japan, all face different degrees of economic coercion. And uh, I think our consumers, um, that the power of consumers and responsible decisions um, that is accompanied by you know, transparent information and, and you know, quality global debate on um, you know, the need to support economies that are under distress because of political coercion, uh, but also the need to steer away from uh, those consumer products that are, are, are supporting um, uh, uh, totalitarian uh, regimes. Um, I think this is a, a third, you know, category of, of tools that we have to look into. So, so you know, I think there's a lot that can be done, and 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 there are a lot of you know threads uh, that are um, on 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 the table um, on the agenda already among the very uh, the various democracies. And um, this summit, upcoming summit, would be a good opportunity to. Um, you have a clear eyed look at the challenges and threats, but also have a realistic, pragmatic, but also innovative approach to finding uh, those tools. And, and again, I want to stress, you know, the, the only alternative to, to, to strategic autonomy, and, and again, we, we don't know exactly what that means, but um, a need for strategic unity and solidarity uh, to support each other. And, you know, in the context of the Czech Parliament speaker saying that you know I am Taiwanese. I think when when any country is facing such coercion, you know we have to be able to say it loudly, I am Lithuanian, um, you know I am Taiwanese or I am I am Ukrainian, and you know all, all of the countries that are facing this uh, do need you know solidarity from other democracies, and that's what's important. And I think that's something that Taiwan seeks to highlight. Um, 
you know, the, the tremendous accomplishments to build one of the freest and most open democracies in Asia, but the enormity of the challenges that we're facing and the need to have solidarity behind that. Thank you, B. Kim. That was really beautifully said. And the two words that ring, you know, ring so loud in this discussion are unity and solidarity. Um, you know, people don't like to be pushed around. Uh, and when they're threatened, they don't necessarily just surrender. Uh, quite the contrary, um, you know, they they can they can stand up uh, and defend their uh, their human dignity. And I think what we're seeing in this discussion is that it's not just a matter of big powers. It's a matter of small countries like Lithuania, the Czech Republic and other countries, Australia, um, Sweden and what have you uh, that are want to be counted. And it's also people. It's also civil society uh, and this idea of having an approach to this issue of uh, democratic unity and solidarity that involves civil society, I think is extremely important. So we're at really an important turning point in history. I think this has been a great discussion when we started thinking about how to broaden our discussion from just getting Asian democracies together to bringing Europe in. Uh, I didn't fully anticipate all the fundamental strategic issues that we would be talking about, but it's a profoundly important discussion and we look forward to continuing it. I want to thank you, uh, Zygis. I want to thank Alina. I want to thank Maiko and especially B. Kim. Uh, we look forward to working with all of you and others on this issue uh, as we look to the future with um, realism, but also uh, with hope and solidarity. Thank you very much.